Hello everyone and welcome back to ADAP, our course on advanced design and programming. After covering method types and properties and classes, class types, class properties in the previous two lectures, we will now look at subtyping and inheritance, how to design your class hierarchies. This will be led by the Liskov substitutable principle or behavioral subtyping, the LSP, which is quite important. We'll talk about co and contravariance and the abstract superclass rule and how to evolve your class hierarchies at the end. So we need to understand that there are different forms of subtyping, where subtyping means how do you say, how do you define that one particular type of object is a specialization of some other type of object. We want to build hierarchies in modeling the world where one concept, one type, one class is more general than the other. And as you probably guessed, we'll then use inheritance to make the more specialized uh, type or class, a subtype or subclass of the more general class. The problem with it is that there are many different ways of looking at how to identify what's more general and what's more specialized. So here is one example, modeling graphical objects. In general, in this course, we take the European or Scandinavian perspective. We want to capture the reality of the world rather than some implementation aspects of software systems. So you see there is an abstract class graphical object and the question now is how do triangle and square and circle relate to each other in terms of to each other and with respect to the graphical object which might be a super class or a super type, the more general type. And there are different answers to that. Uh, the most common one would perhaps be from a domain specific, from modeling the world. Well, triangle and square and circle are so different. They are all graphical objects, so they are subtypes or subclasses. A class triangle would be a subclass of graphical object. But the three subtypes here, the three graphical shapes, uh, they do not relate to each other at all. So none is a subtype of the other. They are all siblings, all directly inherit from graphical object. This gets immediately more complicated as you take a mathematical perspective. The difference here is that with looking at the application domain in object-oriented terms, you usually have some sort of behavioral idea. These are objects with identity, what's really the key about these objects and how do they relate, while a mathematical model, which usually struggles with the notion of identity, looks at the inner content, the attributes of the fields of some objects and tries to construct some generalization or specialization from that. So looking at these four, three graphical objects here, um, the uh, route, the rectangle and the square, like before, they would, you would probably say, well, they are three different subclasses of graphical object. Or maybe you have a different idea. Um, maybe you say they are all, they all have four corners. Or maybe you say from a mathematical perspective, mm, a square really is just a special type of rectangle. So a square should be a subtype, subclass of rectangle. And while that's conceivable, that's the mathematical inner perspective and it's not how a user would look at it. A user would be rather confused if they think they have a rectangle and they move one uh, length or change one length and suddenly the other one changes two, which would be the property that guarantees it's a, it's a square. So um, the mathematical perspective would look at the inner structure and model according to that and say the domain perspective using graphical objects here would look at it and look at it from a behavioral uh, domain specific perspective as how are these objects which are identifiable in their own right, have an identity beyond their inner structure, how do they behave? 
Here's an even more complicated uh, look at that. We have a one-dimensional object, uh, a point in a just a one-dimensional object. We have a line, so a two-dimensional object, and then I'm illustrating maybe we have a three-dimensional object illustrated to the right. Um, are these, how do they relate? Um, if you want to display that uh, as graphical objects, and again, the mathematical perspective would look at the number of dimensions, while to a graphical object perspective, this is very different if you have one, two, or three-dimensional objects. So let me resolve that here by on the left side showing you the domain modeling perspective uh, with a notion, with an object oriented thinking and objects which have identity and to the right how you would model it if maybe you're developing a mathematical library and where you think the inner structure of objects is what it's about. So the graphical object would have different shapes as subtypes which do not inherit from each other. And similar, uh, so that's what's true for triangle, square, and circle. Similarly, one-dimensional, two-dimensional, three-dimensional figures are also different uh, in terms of handling, behavior, and so forth. They would all be sibling classes, perhaps, but not inherit from each other. If you take the structural perspective, then for example, with respect to the shapes, you might want to make square a special form of rectangle. After all, it's a special form of rectangle. It is like a rectangle, behaves like a rectangle, except that the uh, sides always have the same length. And from a mathematical perspective, one-dimensional figures are really just a special case of two-dimensional figures and three-dimensional figures. So in the world of mathematics, with a structure-oriented view, that would be how you go about it. We will see an object-oriented design that is not a good idea, though sometimes for code inheritance purposes you may go that particular route, but this will only be discussed much later in this class. In advanced object-oriented modeling, we follow the Liskov substitutable principle, the LSP, or behavioral subtyping, to conclude or identify what domain concept should be a subtype or supertype of another concept. Here's the original mathematical uh, definition. So if you have instances of some type T and you can prove a property about them, then if for uh, instances of another type S, uh, you can prove these properties, then S is a subtype. Um, in simpler terms, anything that you know to be true about instances of some type should also hold for instances of its subtype. So this allows you to think in terms of supertypes or abstract classes later on, or just interfaces, and program against these interfaces. And if the Liskov substitutable principle holds, and you've designed your systems properly following it, then as you program against the interface, whatever the implementation classes of the objects behind the interface, they will conform to that interface. That would be the LSP in action. Even simpler, no surprises if you're using an interface because whatever the object behind the interface, if it conforms to the interface, that will give you no surprises. So I started by talking about types because that's what computer science or researchers do. Of course, in object-oriented programming, um, it's usually then called classes or interfaces, which are the programming language representation of the classes. So let's now take the notion of type and bring it to object-oriented modeling and programming, design and programming, and talk about classes. Here you see a class hierarchy on the left. There is an interface for persistent objects, objects that can be stored in a database. Then you have an implementation, a class that implements the persistent interface called data object. That's obviously very general. And then you have the particular subclass photo, which are the photo objects. And so they are subclasses of data object. So what's happening here is you have a hierarchy of types mapped onto interfaces and classes. And the subtype or the subclass or the implementing class, they extend what they inherit from the superclass or supertype. 
So persistent really doesn't say much. Uh, data object only adds to it without, um, without uh, violating anything that inherits from persistence. It just adds to it. And so does photo. Uh, the things that photo adds to a data object are all the photo specific things that data objects don't know about. So they added methods and added fields. And because the superclass doesn't say anything about it, this extension or addition of features um, uh, is within the scope of the previously the supertype as well, because uh, there are no, no uh, properties that could be violated. It gets more interesting when you look at constraining constraints through subclasses. So in Wildsight, there is the notion that if there's a photo and uh, something might be wrong with the photo, it could be a copyright violation, it could be an offensive photo, some other reasons why the photo maybe should not be shown. So you can file a case uh, to have a photo removed uh, and uh, that would become a photo case. For simplicity's sake, I model the reason that some user gives you for why the photo maybe should not be shown as an enumeration called flag reason. Why was the photo flagged? And so there's copyright violation and then there's offensive photo and so forth. Now photo case knows that there are these flag reasons and can return some upon a call to a method, method get reason. And the property or the promise to clients of photo case is that it could be any flag reason from that enumeration. We make no guarantees that which particular flag reason it is, but it will be one of those. And then you can have a subclass copyright photo case, which by definition, even hard coded, will always return a copyright uh, flag reason, the, the enum for the copyright violation and flag reason. And this is a constraining of the space. The superclass says any of these and the subclass says always that particular one. And so the uh, superclass really just opens the space and the subtype constrains it. And for this to work, the uh, superclass cannot promise that any other one comes. It only says any of those. And so that needs to be kept in mind. Now, this actually gets more complicated as soon as we look at what often happens, the development of parallel or dual class hierarchies. This is a common occurrence. You have uh, classes which collab, the instances of which collaborate. For example, the object manager class knows how to save and load objects. So it relies on the persistent interface for loading and saving objects. For photo objects, we have a photo manager. So the photo manager has added functionality on loading and saving uh, photo objects. For example, specialized search functions on how to find a particular photo. Now you have a super class collaboration between object manager and persistent. And now you have subclasses, subtypes, where photo manager is a subtype of object manager and photo is a subtype of persistent. And what gets specialized is the relationship between the two. Object manager only says it can read and write persistent objects, but the photo manager class constrains it to, I can only load, I can only read and write photo objects. Uh, as long as the object manager makes no promise as to what else can be said about the object that can be read or written, then that it is persistent. Uh, this does not violate the Leskov substitute principle, even though you uh, kind of narrow down the scope. But here you really need to think about it as refining the collaboration. So you take two classes, in unison or in jointly and subclass, subtype them, including their association on a modeling level or simply the relationship between instances of these classes.
programming languages or typing mechanisms give you some support to express what I just did, uh, what I just explained with the association refinement principle. Um, the challenge is that as you program, you always program one class and the other class is in your mind, but you're not talking about the class. That's a problem with programming languages not really being able to express the whole collaboration as one thing. Uh, uh, we will see how to do that later. But as you program, you always program individual classes and any relationship the instances of a class have with instances of another class is in your code. And it's not explicit in that you write uh, in that you declare a relationship so and so which has these or that properties. You always embed the relationship between two classes in these two classes rather than having a first class citizen of type uh, relationship on a programming level. To make some of that possible, nevertheless, some programming languages offer you the concepts of covariant and contravariant redefinition. Uh, covariant redefinition applies to the arguments and results. So it's basically uh, the specialization of an argument or return type uh, of some method. And you say such a method has been covariantly redefined if the result type or the argument types to the methods are more narrow. They are subtype of the original superclass, supertype, result or argument types. So a covariant redefinition is if the object, if the photo manager accepts only photos rather than persistent, uh, any persistent uh, object that may not be a photo. So that would be a covariant redefinition of the interface of the photo manager uh, restricted the argument types to a uh, right object like that. Contravariant redefinition goes the other way. You make it wider. So the subtype or a method in the subtype, uh, the method has been contravariantly redefined if either the result types or the argument types uh, accept a broader range uh, of, uh, of objects, meaning a supertype of uh, those that the supertype uh, defined for them. So if um, uh, a subclass of photo manager suddenly would accept persistent again, so my photo manager accepts persistent rather than just photo, you just contravariantly redefine the argument type. And this now can be used to more precisely express extension respectively constraining of subtypes in the form of class hierarchies. So to wrap your head around it, here's a simple, simple quiz. Um, which of these contravariant redefinition, covariant redefinition uh, violates the LSP? So that's not a good thing. We want to know which one violates the LSP, if any, um, with respect to result types, the return values of, uh, of a method call. If you make it wider, like in contravariant redefinition, or if you make it more specific as in covariant redefinition, or both or none. What do you think? So the redefinition of result types in a contravariant form, meaning it's broader, will surprise users of the supertype because if they expect uh, a photo, but suddenly uh, get uh, any persistent object that is not a photo, they will be surprised. So that is a violation of the LSP. So in this case, covariant redefinition of result types is the way to go or what's possible without breaking the LSP. Because all you're saying in the subtype or in the subclass is that, okay, the supertype promises persistent, uh, I will just always return a specific um, form of persistent object, say the photo object, and only ever the photo object, and that's just fine. And that's covariant redefinition of result types. What about method arguments? How would that work? Contravariant redefinition of method argument types would mean the subtype um, accepts uh, more, and covariant redefinition means it accepts less 
So in this case, you always need to think I'm working through a super type, but there actually is an instance of a dynamic type of a subtype uh, behind that super type or interface I'm programming against. Will I be surprised? Will I get a surprise exception because I stuffed in, I provided the wrong value? So there, contravariant redefinition will not lead to surprises, but covariant redefinition will. And hence, uh, covariant redefinition of argument types would violate the LSP. In Java, um, we actually have examples of that. Uh, in particular, we have an example or examples of covariant redefinition of result types. An example is the clone method defined on object. If you call clone on any given object using the object interface, what you're promised is a return value of type object. Well, objects when cloned give you another object. Now your subclass, my class, can also implement a clone method that takes care of the extra fields you might have added to my class. But you can also guarantee, or that's the intention of specializing clone, that the object returned is not just of object in general, but more specifically of my class and only ever my class. That is a covariant redefinition of the return um, uh, value type. So that is an example of covariant redefinition. And we have some of that in Wildside as well. Again, the object manager create object method, for example, gets specialized in the photo manager subclass and the return type goes from persistent to photo. And that satisfies the LSP and life is happy because the behavior of objects will not surprise you if you use them through a superclass or a super type. Contravariance is present in some languages but not in Java. You could have it and not break the LSP for contravariant redefinition of method arguments but um, Again, Java doesn't offer that. In other languages, it's possible. So with that, you may have wondered about multiple inheritance. You probably know it's not possible in Java, but it's possible, for example, in C++. Here's how you could possibly model graphical object and then specifically rectangle and square in C++. You have a superclass, graphical object, and you have the rectangle subclass, and you have the square subclass. From a behavioral perspective, you want rectangle and square to be subtypes of graphical object, because that's how a user perceives them. But then, for the purposes of not re-implementing or double-implementing code that's really similar, in C++, you could have so-called private inheritance where square inherits from rectangle. So square would not even have a field for length of a side. It would inherit from rectangle with two sides, A and B, and it would be able to use those, to use those fields. Private in C++ actually means that you can't assign um, polymorphically along those lines. So you can't use the square under a super type rectangle, you're just really reusing methods and fields. Um, if this looks convoluted to you, two types of inheritance relationship, maybe it is. Some people like it. I generally have a strong preference. I believe that's also what the LSP says. Focus on modeling the domain right, because that will speak to the intuition of any programmer and ultimately to the user. Get the domain understanding right and don't focus too much on code reuse. If you nevertheless wonder, can't I get better code reuse in Java, even though it has no multiple inheritance? Of course you can. And the way you do it is by not using multiple inheritance, which you can't anyway, but rather using delegation. So in Java, you would implement it like you see here. The classes rectangle and square, again, are subclasses of graphical object to sibling classes from a behavioral perspective. But the square class, rather than um, uh, providing all the methods of the rectangle class in a duplicated, again, implemented form, 
would simply hold a reference to an internal rectangle object and use that A to represent its state, the two sides, but then wrap the method of rectangle and forward most of the functionality uh, to it. With some modifications, for example, if you change the side uh, of a square, then obviously both sides of the rectangle need to change in line. So there's some added semantics, exactly the semantics that constitutes what a square is and how it's different from a rectangle. And this is possible and in a sense also much more cleaner from a modeling perspective than using multiple inheritance or a private inheritance of C++. Another way or another name for that is interface versus implementation inheritance, where interface inheritance is effectively subtyping and should follow the LSP. So when you create a subclass, you look at the two class interface or the two interfaces of the superclass or the interface you're implementing and the implementing class or the subclass and you align the interfaces, you think of them as types, you think of them as promises made to users and if you then follow the LSP, you get inheritance interface and you can do that nicely in Java with Java interfaces and classes. On the other hand, you have implementation inheritance where you inherit from a class for the sole purpose of uh, inheriting the fields and the methods that do some calculations with the fields. So that would be if you make square in Java, as you can, a subclass of rectangle. Um, that will break the LSP because a user of the rectangle class who thinks who's holding a rectangle object in the hand certainly expects to be able to set the two sides of a rectangle independently of each other and will be very surprised again if they change one side and the other changes accordingly so that always the semantics of a square object which is hiding behind the rectangle object in my example is guaranteed. So you can do that in Java. Um, you can do implementation inheritance in single inheritance. It's just not a good class hierarchy because you're breaking the LSP. It's not behavioral subtyping. You're confusing users and eventually you'll get weird runtime behavior and outright um, bugs. So don't do it. Use delegation instead. On an implementation level, we have to add to what we just discussed for types and interfaces. We just discussed, discussed, discussed how subtypes should be conforming to the expectations that supertypes declare. And we also looked a little bit at code inheritance and how to efficiently implement things. Still now for cleanliness of the implementation of class hierarchies, I would like to look at the use of abstract classes. So there's a clear difference between inheritance and abstractedness. Abstractness, inheritance is simply the relationship between a superclass and a subclass. And abstract is a property of a class where its instances there are no instances if the class is abstract. So you cannot create instances of an abstract class, which means that on some aspects, the semantics of the abstract class have not been implemented. They have not been made narrowed down, made precisely uh, precise. And hence, uh, it is waiting for subclasses to tie together those open open issues by giving them specific meaning or semantics. There's a rule, an old rule, not, not widely shared, even though I think it's quite important, widely understood. I think people intuitively do it right. So this rule is the abstract superclass rule, which says in a super clean design, all superclasses must be abstract. Because as soon as a class is concrete or uh, specific can be instantiated the semantics just got closed right and uh, so there's defined behavior and if you rely on that if it leaks through the interface uh, 
then you cannot subclass that class any longer. So concrete classes in the inverse to this have to be leaf classes and the super classes of a class hierarchy have to be abstract. So as a consequence, the implementation of a super class uh, should, be, uh, should be abstract. So you look at your model, you look at your design, you try to understand is this a super type? Does it exist as a category of objects? And there will be subtypes that specialize. So it's the graphical object that's a general category, but I couldn't instantiate it. Uh, I can only instantiate sub subclasses. So then graphical object is an abstract class or interface, an interface. And any implementation you write for the graphical object class or interface uh, has to be abstract because you don't even know how to instantiate it. There are holes in the semantics and the meaning, which will be filled by the subclasses. Java gives you some ways of expressing that. So you can simply declare a class as abstract. An interface by definition is abstract, but it's not, not a class. Yeah, there's no implementation in an interface. Well, um, not, not quite true, but, but most, mostly there's no implementation in an interface. So by declaration, say abstract class counter or abstract class object manager and so forth. Um, sometimes you are, so I think you should always make that intuition or that, that design aspect explicit by making the class as a whole abstract. But it's also implied if, for example, you have methods that you declare as abstract and forget to make the class itself abstract. As soon as there's an abstract method, the implication is this method has no implementation body and subtypes, subclasses have to implement that particular method. Sometimes you can't do that or you're programming slightly differently. You can implicitly make classes abstract in the sense that you prevent any instantiation. For example, by hiding constructors, you make them private or protected. And then nobody can call new uh, because they don't get to the constructor. Or just not, not half, uh, not half a constructor. And well, you always have the implicit constructor, but you need to hide that. Um, yeah, so there are many ways of how you declare, a, make a class effectively abstract. And I always recommend you do so in an explicit way because you don't want users chasing around in your code, asking themselves, is it an abstract super class or is it a concrete leaf class of a class hierarchy? So always in my book use abstract in the definition, in the declaration of the class. When you think about class hierarchies, then it has some consequences if you follow this rule. All intermediate, so the root class and all the intermediate classes in a class hierarchy should always be abstract because they are there for extension by subclasses and concrete subclasses. And only the leaf classes of the class hierarchy can then be concrete classes. So as, as you want to instantiate as you want to create objects, you always have to turn to the concrete classes, obviously, which should be leaf classes and tie together whatever has been left open, left abstract in the super classes. Some leaf classes can be abstract, but that only means uh, that they have not been extended yet or in this particular use of the class hierarchy, they have, there was no need to extend them because they're not, not, he, not needed for the application being developed. So um, let me return to why you might want to follow this rule. And it's simply that it meshes nicely with the LSP. Um, as you leave a class abstract, you really think hard about how does my inheritance interface look like to make it concrete in subclasses and thereby also how do I define the promises that I make to use clients and where do I leave open? Where do I leave the space for customization through subclasses now uh, to use clients and then in the implementation by way of the inheritance interface to subclasses. 
and that makes for better reusable uh, superclasses because if you don't do that and try to subclass concrete classes you are probably eventually going to violate the LSP. So all of this is relevant for the design of class hierarchies and of course class hierarchies change. So let me illustrate that here. I'm using a super clean, maybe over the top super clean example, but the point is to illustrate. So on the left, you can see how in wild side we model permissions or user types. So the generic abstract client, and it could either be a guest who visits the site but is not logged in, or it's a user who is logged in. Then there are specialized user types as a moderator who can uh, moderate photos that have been flagged and say, don't tell the system, don't show this, don't show this photo any longer. And then there's an even more powerful user called the administrator who's also always a moderator in this modeling. And uh, so they're another subclass. I wouldn't model it for a larger system like this. You would rather use roles. But here I chose the simple class hierarchy perspective and it doesn't hurt that an administrator is also always a moderator. So on the left, you see a class hierarchy that does not follow the ASR, the abstract superclass rule, because the user class is concrete and moderator still inherits from it. So not good from an ASR perspective. If you wanted to transform it to become a clean example of the ASR, you have to change it from the left to the right. So you can see how there is the client interface or abstract superclass, and then we have an abstract user abstract class, an abstract moderator subclass, an abstract administrator class, and the concrete classes that give us the specific user object, the specific moderator object, the specific administrator object, they are concrete subclasses of the abstract corresponding class and end the class hierarchy there. So abstract user has two subclasses, the concrete user class and the abstract moderator class, which continues the class hierarchy for further use and reuse. And so that would be uh, the ASR applied to its fullest. So that's a very clean design on the right side, except that you may feel when you actually look at the code that all the user class does or the moderator class or the administrator class really does over the abstract classes is have a concrete constructor with a few more parameters that it passes to its abstract superclass and that's it. So the user, moderator and administrator class are super shallow, which is why people would usually uh, start and end with the solution on the left where that constructor is public and otherwise it's really a, an abstract class and all that happens is the one-time configuration through the user part. So as you program the thing on the left, you're effectively merging and have two use cases or two scenarios for the classes on the left, which are to serve as an abstract superclass and by way of the constructor also kind of fold in the concrete, the separate concrete subclass that you really should have into the actual abstract superclass. As long as you know that and handle it accordingly, you will be fine. So if you started out with this abstract, super clean design on the left and rolled it into the one uh, on the right, you really rolled the default concrete subclass into the abstract superclass. And that is sometimes possible or that is valid if it really is just the constructors, really just some minor configuration uh, for the default subclass and that's it. As soon as you have a second implementation class that is not the default any longer, if you had two very different types of users, I would strongly recommend you have the abstract user class again. Otherwise, you'll get confused on the multitude of constructors and get confused about the two different, different types of users you might have. So when, you, when, when should you go either way? Uh, well, in complex, when you're preparing for complex situations, uh, you're better off 
in writing more and being very explicit. If you think you can simplify and don't expect more, much evolution there, then you can fold default sub implementation subclasses into the abstract superclass and have that one way into the class hierarchy for, for new objects. You get less classes then, and maybe, maybe not. It's easier to understand. It depends on whether the readers understand this type of uh, class hierarchy building. One final aspect I would like to talk about is the behavior along the class hierarchy, meaning you have subclasses which rely on the superclasses, so they call methods of each, of each other and there are certain patterns of how to do that uh, well. Specifically, inheritance interfaces sometimes cascade, meaning, say, abstract main or model main in this example defines a template method and then uh, it gets overwritten in multiple places in the subclasses. So let's take a look as an example at the startup and shutdown of, uh, of a system. And there are always, uh, to stick with our example, two versions of starting up a flower or wild site system. There's running it as a service. So that means uh, getting it running, connecting to the database, start serving photos. And then there's the scripting where you just do something where you need the model and start the application. And then after the task was done, you shut it down. So both are subclasses. Uh, one is the script subclass, script main, and another one is the actual uh, service main. So you inherit uh, from model main, uh, startup and shutdown. Startup sets up the model, gets everything going so that either the service can do its job or the script has a database or a model to work with. And then later, when the system is being shut down, there's a shutdown method which cleans up everything and shuts things down. So the key first to understand here is that you are calling up the uh, class hierarchy. So let's assume we are just starting up the system, the service, and I'm sure many of you have programmed this in one way or another. The method startup is called on service main on the lowest leaf or class of the system. Our startup is called and the first thing that method does is call the superclasses startup method, which in turn at the beginning of the startup method will call its superclasses startup method. So you're working your way up the class hierarchy from the leaf to the root as far as it goes uh, by calling at the start of your method the superclasses method. So that's a super call here. And then when they return, when the object, the control flow returns from your superclass code, then you add your own code. So up, 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 and then do your thing, return, do your thing, return, do your thing, return. And that's a very clean way that's understood by programmers, hopefully everywhere, where you see that you have a class hierarchy call chain to the superclass method, and then you extend it with something that's specific to your current uh, class. So you can see how service main calls model main, model main calls um, abstract main. And in abstract main, there is uh, the superclass of that. There is no startup method abstract main just does its job returns to model main um, which now does its additional thing to what it expected the superclasses to do and then returns to service main and so forth so in java um, this works nicely it works nicely in c plus plus two a particular pitfall in c plus plus always was that uh, if you hadn't had a full constructor run the object hadn't even been constructed so it would be a really bad idea in the constructors of a C++ object to start work on the current class without having gone through the superclass because the superclass object hasn't been properly initialized. So here in Java, the objects are fully there though. And uh, you can call um, any method because the object is there. How these methods are called also depends on 
context so for example starting up the flowers main uh, as a standalone application would simply have a main or run method where you would have it which was a template method um, which would call on start execute and shut down that's a common pattern while if you run it in a surflet container or surflet context this would be called from the surflet uh, um, context manager and uh, so your startup methods would be called upon using their framework using a surflet framework and then you would branch into your own methods so we talked about different forms of subtyping key is to understand that good object oriented modeling is a domain and application specific modeling you're trying to capture the world also behavioral subtyping and that this has been enshrined as the last liskov substitutable principle lsp where you program subtypes or subclasses always in such a way that you don't surprise anyone who's using your objects through a superclass or supertype interface and if you do so you reduce significantly reduce the amounts of surprises and hence bugs that a user of your code might 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 experience um, we applied this to class hierarchies we saw how co contravariants give us some additional programming level functionality to express these relationships but really what we want is not just to be programming individual classes but groups of classes as a collaboration so that we can think about the relationships as first class citizens and in a later section we will see this when we talk about collaborations and role modeling. Uh, we touched on implementation issues, most notably the abstract superclass rule, which suggests that any class that can and should be subclassed should always be abstract. And as soon as you have a concrete subclass, it's the end of the class hierarchy tree. Concrete classes are always leaf classes of the tree. And then we looked at some more examples. So, so thank you very much for your time and attention here and I will see you in the next session. Bye bye.